Um, this is a really important area um, um, from our perspective in Built Heritage. It, it's one that's going to become, I think, even more pressing because, um, you know, with policy change, with climate action, we are going to have to get our head around reusing buildings and the resources and assets that we have, retrofitting our towns and places. Um, and really, um, no one is the one solution is actually is this idea of working together. And I think, you know, a lot of our problems in the past, I suppose, came from silo working or silo thinking. So we're all part of the solution. And as I say, today for me is a very um, good step forward, uh, trying to work with you and, and trying to find out. I'm very happy to try and help uh, as I can. Now I'll just try and get my head around clickers here. Um, I just the first slide there is is about some of the work that's been done uh, under the Historic Towns Initiative um, and other uh, funding programs. But it, it it is about I suppose getting good access to uh, towns and to monuments and to protected structures in general. Um, and I suppose the policy context um, that we're operating in is in our national policy on architecture and it's called Places for People. Uh, sustainable development goals are embedded in it, um, high quality principles, um, the idea that universal design is, is front and forward of everything we think about and, and do. And I suppose when we were devising the um, policy and architecture, we were very aware that there was very little research on the built environment, which also doesn't really assist us when we're trying to do some of the heavy lifting that we're doing. So one of the actions of the uh, policy is to carry out research and to disseminate it. And this morning, I was very encouraged to have a, a phone call from colleagues in a, a university who were saying to me that there is a new European standard for access and that it's now starting to inform uh, funding programs and research. And I think that's a really um, great move forward in, in terms of uh, supporting this idea of integrated thinking, of bringing not just access and universal design, but also thinking about sustainability, climate action, uh, uh, energy efficiency, um, and I suppose the, the whole sort of social and cultural dimension that that all brings together. So I hope to be able to come back to you with maybe some research in the future about um, practice and toolkits for this kind of thinking. Um, so, in doing this um, uh, presentation, it sort of made me ref reflect back on, I suppose I had 20 years practice at, at a local authority level, and um, when we started this whole, um, I suppose, approach to dealing with built heritage, we had very few tools, and this uh, advice series on access was one of the first uh, guidance that the department um, came forward with to try and sort of explain, um, you know, the, the positioning of built heritage in our thinking and how we might apply uh, legislation and regulatory um, obligations. And I suppose this slide just sort of uh, widens the idea about heritage buildings, you know, to, you know, some quite ordinary everyday um, uh, places, bank buildings, or it could be to uh, giving better access to designed landscapes, parks, whatever. These are all things that are coming up more and more uh, frequently. Um, so um, in, in the architectural heritage guidelines, I suppose between the advice series and the architectural heritage guidelines, the, the context for the built heritage is set out. And I suppose what I wanted to do today was sort of um, remind you of the documents that kind of give you that insight about, you know, what are the issues and concerns for uh, cultural heritage in its widest form, as I say, from individual buildings, monuments, to planned landscapes, and where you might actually get guidance um, about various aspects of it. Um, in Chapter 18 of the Architectural Heritage Guidelines, um, access is dealt with specifically. As part of my presentation today, what I wanted to do was to show you a few interesting uh, I think case studies that sort of demonstrate, you know, this idea of the integrated thinking. I was very fortunate to work with the design team uh, 
uh, they very much, um, how I say, integrated me into the compliance submissions of the National Gallery of Ireland. And access, of course, was one of the really big issues for that building. It had to be universally accessible. Um, and of course, it was a 19th century building that, um, you know, had gone through various modifications and extensions. So it had to be really thought in a, in a very much holistic way. This slide here shows uh, the approach taken to getting you over the front uh, step. Um, typically, the entrances to historic buildings are the, the first sort of obstacle or barrier to, to address. And in this case, uh, the opportunity was taken to uh, provide level access, access from the street level all the way to the entrance threshold. Um, we were able to leave the entrance steps in situ, but we were able to arrive at, at the point of threshold. Um, the original entrance hall to the National Gallery had been reconfigured, and that was on picked to sort of bring back the original historical concept and volume of the entrance hall, sliding doors, um, and then on through the vertical access um, that needed to be created for the gallery spaces so that they could all be integrated. Um, a service yard in the middle of the building was used to insert a state-of-the-art lift that was fully uh, compliant for all wheelchair sizes, and that got you to all the floor areas. And then where there were unusual kind of uh, say 20th century gallery ex expansions, um, wheelchair platform lifts were used uh, and designed in very much as part of the interiors of the actual gallery. So it's an interesting project and, and I recommend you, you walk it at some stage and see how they dealt with access. They, they really took it on in a very serious way. And of course, I'm just talking about um, that particular level, but there's also very good signage and, and, and all of that. Um, there are other building type bodies, and I think um, the sort of medieval fabric ones tend to be the most challenging from our perspective, and we do a lot of work with national monuments. And there's a lot of money and funding at the moment in terms of um, making our cultural sites more accessible to our, um, visitors, um, international visitors, et cetera. I, I just wanted to illustrate some of the um, conservation principles of dealing with um, uh, buildings like this. And also uh, to show you what I think are best practice exemplars. This is Carlingford Castle, which was you know, a very inaccessible uh, site. And I suppose by applying the, the principles of architectural conservation and universal design, um, this project, I think, is a really uh, great success. And I think Joe Biden had the enjoyment of it. So it, it is very much about uh, awareness of the site, understanding its context, its character, and its significance, and then uh, coming up with an access strategy. Um, and this one, I think, really um, demonstrates you know, well-considered intervention and is a successful solution. So this idea of good conservation work should do as much as necessary and as little as possible is really, I think, something that uh, conservation architects and practitioners live by. So this is the actual uh, project itself. And you can actually see in the image on the left that it's hardly discernible, the insertion of the ramp and walkway. And if I just put my finger on it, then you can see the viewing in certain places. Um, but um, when you look at the map on the right hand side, um, I do have a laser, Mirai, do I? Yeah. Yes. You can sort of see that you have level access, you have a ramp access here, you can get in, you get ramped round, you get into this area here, you can come out here and you can actually experience the um, whole um, vista and aspect out over the sea. And it's done in a, a very attractive um, steel. Um, it's a very, um, how will I say, um, contemporary, um, but it really honors and respects the, the, the building. And I think succeeds in making it very accessible. It's a light touch as the architect has described. Um, universal design, as I say, um, I think this is a, um, something that I just wanted to draw to your attention with Town Centre first. 
Um, there's a real focus on towns. Um, the recommendation is that when you're thinking about universal design, that you think at it from the outset. So, um, you know, embedding it into the plans for towns, I think is a really uh, important idea. And, and it's something that should go into every brief that's being commissioned uh, for Town Centre First. It's that integrated uh, process from the get-go um, that addresses, um, you know, good um, surfaces, pavement, mobility, uh, signage, decluttering, um, sustainable, um, how I say, practices like good materials that are native, um, in integration with, um, you know, uh, suds um, and the like. So it, it really needs to be uh, embraced as part of a town plan. Um, I, when I originally did this lecture, 10 plus years ago, um, I had um, very much looked at uh, Trinity as being a really interesting example of, I, I can remember back, they were the first organization in the door to Dublin City Council uh, looking to uh, implement an access strategy. And, um, you know, I, I, I think um, going back and looking at it again, I think, it, you know, there was things that they did very well at that point in time. Um, and I suppose it's that combination of um, the pre-site information. Um, and I even checked today now for Carlingford, you know, did they have all that information up and, and they had, how do you access the site? It's all there on, on the website and you know it's going to work for you. Um, the trained staff and the awareness, um, the external landscape. And I mean, this was something that they really uh, pushed very hard on. And it was something that, you know, um, took a while uh, to work out, um, but they were adamant that they needed a smooth surface through the cobbles of, of Trinity. And you can see in the image there, um, this is the new paving that went in and it went uh, around the edges of the, the four courts. Um, and all I want to say to you is that there was a lot of learning from that exercise because um, when you when you see complexes like that, you assume that things are straight and they're arranged um, that they relate exactly to one another. And it's only when you start to put in something that's very metric and um, grid that you suddenly realize that re relationships aren't perfect. So, for instance, there's on one of the um, sort of you know these classical door cases, the paving is off center. And it's those sort of things that you have to sort of think of as a designer. How, how does this very enforced grid on a very organic space actually work and adjust ac accordingly? Um, the other thing that Trinity did very well was they, they designed ramps and access that um, were very subtle, very low key. And in this image here, you can actually hardly see I know it's not a great quality slide, but you can sort of see the um, outline of the ramp. And that is sort of a testimony to how subtle the design of the uh, steps were. They did other things as well. They, they pulled steps away from the actual building and created a new platform and then reinstated the historic steps. So they actually um, worked a lot with the existing fabric, minimal intervention where they could. You can sort of see that the ramp here is a very simple metal ramp, reversible, or you could take it away if you had a different or a better way of doing it. And then good sort of signage and access um, at the actual door itself. Um, other guidance that I felt um, that really um, gave you a great insight into context and sort of wider than just um, buildings. Um, I noticed you were looking at the bringing back homes, which is really very useful. It gives you a very good sort of spread of the legislative context. But I also found the Irish wheelchair um, uh, access guidelines really useful um, from my perspective, keeping up with the sizes of wheelchairs and requirements of space and stuff. This seems to be very current and up to date. And then I noticed the NDA had a new draft uh, code of practice, which gets you right into the subject very quickly and easily in terms of um, dealing with um, public buildings and what you need to have uh, awareness of. Um, 
I suppose the, the, the main thing is, as I say, um, you're all the time trying to think um, from the outset about uh, existing buildings. And I just wanted to say, reflecting back on the 20 years, when we introduced the Architectural Heritage Guidelines, of course, we were conscious that uh, dealing with fire and protective structures at the one time at the start of the planning process was really important. And then access requirements came in subsequently. So I think it's a really good moment in time to sort of bring all that practice together. I think Town Centre First is actually going to really develop that expertise, that sort of um, collaborative or multidisciplinary way of working. And um, that should ensure better outcomes for existing buildings and people learning from one another. I mean, the point is that while you might have code that might be standard, I suppose the main point about existing buildings is that sometimes you mightn't have a standard solution working for an existing building. Buildings do extraordinary things, extraordinary designs, extraordinary different threshold levels, maybe very complicated or elaborate entrances, steps, whatever. So sometimes it is a case by case um, approach and sometimes it has to be a, a very innovative solution to, to drive the, the, the outcome that you need to, to achieve. And giving that task just to one person in isolation is not going to be as successful if a few people's heads come together and actually try and drive a, a solution. Um, and I also remember using this book, Accessible Heritage Sites, and I thought that this was a very useful document as well to sort of um, understand the conflict between regulation and legislation and you know this idea that there needs to be a balanced compromise so that you land on the right side that's both beneficial for enhanced access but also that is um, not destructive uh, to a building um, and um, I remember my professor in UCD sort of you know really sort of stressing the idea that minimal intervention um, is really desirable because, you know, uses of buildings change, uh, practice change, there's new technologies. And so avoiding uh, a destructive approach is, is really important for a, a very culturally significant building. So, I mean, the NIH tries to draw your attention to maybe the importance of individual buildings. Um, it's an interim survey. It doesn't get you know, a full record of all the buildings. So it really is uh, working with the architectural heritage assessment of a site to actually understand what is culturally significant about a building. It could be just the exterior and its setting, or it could have a very important uh, interior with very early fabric. And that's the sort of information you're trying to get out of a, an architectural heritage assessment. So the conservation principles, um, their work going over, um, understanding the building and its historical development. Um, I, I suppose that's the difference in practice between contemporary design and historical buildings. Um, it's really understanding, you know, is this one of a, of, of a type or is it, is, it, is it a collection of many? Uh, is it rare? Is it you know, really authentic, um, you know, you really have to understand what you're dealing with. Um, the importance of expert advice um, at all stages of the process. And I think um, in, in my experience that where there has been a good design team together and where you know you're not going to be uh, implementing a, a standard solution, um, you know, a managed approach, a, approach and a multidisciplinary team Will, will give you the outcome that you're looking for. And then as I say, it's not just, you know, get the architectural heritage assessment report, but actually understand what is the thing that is being really trying to um, be minded, protected, et cetera. Minimal intervention, what is, what, what, what is that? You know, how far are you prepared to go? Is there an adjustment that can make the thing work or is it a, a wholesale dismantling of a set of steps? Um, record the alterations for, for very important uh, cultural buildings. It's, it's that's best practice. Respect all previous alterations of interest. There can be extensions and modifications to a building, and maybe they give you the opportunity to say insert a, a secondary entrance. Is is that the location where 
um, everybody can um, adjust to, and that becomes the main entrance or access point uh, for, for the building and a less focus on the main entrance repair and retain rather than replace historic fabric. I, I think looking back at a lot of the earlier um, interventions for access that were done, um, we didn't necessarily understand both the repair piece, but also um, the addition of modern uh, materials. And I think where you have um, uh, historic fabric um, reused carefully, but also a new material added to it uh, so that it's not so obvious, I think it works better. Um, you know, obviously new work should be uh, discernible, um, but they need to be sympathetic and re reversible. And I then this piece about craftsmanship, I think is really very important, especially for culturally important buildings. This image is of Monkstan in Dunleary and it's an RIA award scheme. And I just want to draw your attention to, you know, how the public gram is laid out um, how uh, the surfaces are treated and there's very low curves, but also there's a sense of decluttering. There's not too much signage and uh, things like um, let, um, litter boxes or bollards and stuff are kept um, back from the edge of the, of the, of the road, kept back at, at a place in such a way that they're not trip or ob obstacles or hazards. Um, I just also wanted to draw attention to these because I found them particularly useful in terms of existing towns and villages and this whole idea of, you know, upgrading um, parks and, and historic landscapes. And I just included this piece about staircases because I'm very aware in the work that I do that staircases tend to be uh, under the most pressure in terms of access um, and sometimes their full removal is, is where um, the proposals end up. And really, um, from a built heritage point of view, the, the staircase tends to be the flourish or the point of excitement in, in a building. It can be the piece of best craftsmanship. It is the piece maybe that tells you the history of the building. And I suppose resisting heavy modification or removal would be um, a principle that we would think of in the reuse of existing buildings. So this is when you have the subdivision of a, you know, a traditional building, uh, maybe two, three stories into multi multiple uh, apartments, the staircase can be the thing that comes under pressure in terms of access. And I suppose it's the level of subdivision really has to be thought about and the alternative means of escape. Um, and that needs to be at the front of the of the conversation. Um, I drove past Moat today and I happened to be in Moat previously and I was intrigued by Moat when I um, visited it the first time because um, I suppose the point I made to you earlier about this idea about towns and their upgrade and their remaking and their revitalization and the planning that will hopefully come with Town Centre First um, will uh, allow for this integrated thinking about universal access. And I can see in most that a lot of retrofitting of um, access to historic buildings and places uh, took place. and. And I suppose it's that incremental um, uh, adjustment or modification. Um, you know, you could possibly um, have less onerous um, alterations where it was all planned as one landscape or one integrated landscape. And the other reason why I put this slide in is that I, I wanted to sort of make a mental note to do, to remind people that when when you do. Um, carry out you know, this level of um, upgrade, that it's really important to go back and check, is it being maintained? And I have people added other stuff like the, the bins uh, on the right hand side and, and then the bicycle racks I think have gone in here. And there's been an, an ongoing adding in of stuff that suddenly makes the access to the stairs and to the left here over on the right hand side, um, much more complicated. The other thing I wanted to draw attention to was that when we started Access First, we just loved stainless steel. Everything had a stainless steel handrail. And it, it is not a 
a native material or indigenous material. And we have extraordinary um, craftsmen and we have a great tradition of, of other things like flat, flat metals and timber and, and all of these things. So um, I just wanted to make the point, I think people used to think that we used to advocate for stainless steel not necessarily. We, we, we'd sooner you work with the character of the building and make it as symp sympathetic and as sensitive uh, as possible. And then I suppose, you know, these are a very, like, I mean, this is a dramatic, uh, you know, building. Um, I think they, the solution of siting this access ramp to the left hand side was, was well considered. Um, I think it was the detailing of it was less well considered it is quite um uh heavy in terms of the sections and stuff and I, and those are sort of things i think that refinement and stuff would make that sit in a lot um, more sympathetically and then there are a number of handrails here which um i would question whether they're all needed it's it's this is sort of catering for traffic like what you might have coming out of a football stadium and maybe less less handrails would be um, more sensitive to the classical setting of the building so these are these are things that i think you have to go back and look at um, and learn from and as i say i'm open to a conversation about any of this this is where i learn as well um the, oh sorry apologies i just wanted to make one other point this is the bank building, and you know it's 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 quite extraordinary the number of bank buildings that have gone in Irish towns, and I, I remember very clearly that there was a great effort to um, have access improvements, and some of them work very well. Some of them, as I say, this one's quite you know complicated here in the corner, but also um, the use of different materials and. And what I really noticed in some places is that where, say, less um, well detailed things like concrete steps and stuff, they really deteriorate over time. And I think you need to choose appropriate materials to the, the character of the building and think about it in the long term. And as I say, maintenance is a big part of all of this. So the, the rule is that you never show bad images, but I think it's worth sort of thinking about some of the things. And then really you should leave people with only good images. So I'm endeavor not to show you any more um, uh, images that are less, less satisfactory. And um, this is in Kilkenny where a very well considered um, staircase has been put into the rear of the building and providing very good access and you can sort of see it kind of addresses the the plinth of the building and it its material is similar to the paving that surrounds so there's full um circulation space and um a nice um wall with it um, and this is another image of i just wanted to show you alternative materials there's timber and a steel staircase and I suppose both of these examples sort of show, uh, you know, the benefit of a well-sighted uh, intervention, which I think is really important in the heritage context. Um, this one is the, the rising uh, platform um, and uh, it's, it's very discreet to one side. Um, the gravel has been held back off the perimeter of the building and surface, hard surface um, paving to get you to the um, site. And as I said previously, you know, when we started talking about fire and protective structures, we were kind of focused on the fire, but of course you have to get people back out. And I think it's that holistic thinking has sort of um, made us better at planning um, interventions in, 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 in buildings. This is Bungsten again, and I should have really put this with the other slide, but you can sort of see how clear the foot bath, the the poles are all back against the wall, the services boxes, and even the sort of public realm uh, um, artifacts are kept tight to the boundary wall so that, that it's not all out in, 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 the, in the way. Um, I included this one of um, uh, Don Leary, and it, it sort of always um, provoked me in terms of what did I really think about it. This is a, a very beautiful classical little building. 
but there's no doubt that the um, access around it, um, the whole context has become a contemporary one. And in this instance, um, a, a vertical lift has been inserted very quietly to one side and um, you can land up here on the upper level. And of course, on this side here, you have a long ramp running up uh, to the platform as well. So I, I think this was well thought out. You can have, you have one handrail down the middle and of course, where you have um, a lift, you also need steps. But I think this um, design, I suppose, responded to its new context and um, provided a setting for the historic uh, building. Marion Square was an interesting project because uh, Marion Square has a big dip down into it and every um, access point to it had a set of steps. So this is a new entrance area that was created at the east end of Marion Square. And there was also another one created on the north side and they um, took um, the cobbles and split them so that they had a, a smooth face to them. Uh, to make the new threshold and they dished down into the park with this new sort of um, resin band uh, paving uh, through the park. Um, and uh, yep, I think it's a, a good example of an upgrade for a public park. Um, so determination of practicability, sorry. Um, I, I suppose what you're trying to do is uh, limit significant adverse effect on the building. Um, you're trying to avoid major structural alteration. Uh, you're, um, I suppose, trying to deal with maybe sometimes very constrained sites, maybe buildings that are immediate onto a footpath um, or the like. So you, you're, you're trying to make an adjustment somewhere that it isn't, um, an, creates another problem. Um, and I suppose you're also mindful of what you control and what you don't. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, where a specific planning condition prohibits modification, modification of an identified existing feature. So I suppose what maybe a conservation officer might be trying to do is sort of flag, you know, a feature or an element that really shouldn't be altered. It is uh, intrinsic to the actual building. Um, this was a, a, a church and I was sort of trying to show a range of buildings and scenarios. And um, I think when you look at the slides back, the, the screen, the, the, they'll be better than you think, but there's a new ramp has gone in here that lands you up on the existing steps. And it's done very much in the limestone of the actual church itself, a very nice gradient to it. Um, but also in this example, where the um, handrails sort of fit into the decorative stonework of the churches, into the joints of the, of the stonework, and they wrap themselves sympathetically around the colonnaded um, columned, columns up on the door case. The door itself has um, a sliding uh, door fitted uh, in screen in, inside the door, and the actual original doors, which would have been very heavy to open, have been put on parliament hinges so that they open back and are fixed back to the wall. So in terms of the number of people, the windswept nature of the aspect of the church, a lot of things have been um, improved and enhanced and including the uh, surface approach to the actual entrance itself. Um, so that's that example. Um, this one I thought was a really interesting project in um, People's Park in Dunmere, and it, it really was quite a, a triumph in terms of um, improving uh, the access. As you can see, historically, um, there was even access up onto the roof so that you could overlook the park. The whole point about this park was to educate um, the common man, the person who worked from Monday until a Friday evening. And the idea of the park was that they would have access to both music and speakers and exercise and the tea room was all part of that whole social um, philanthropic um, Edwardian idea about educating people. Um, so because this tea room was sited on a high part of the site, it, it didn't have accessibility. 
And the designer worked uh, a very discreet um, ramp around the rear of the property from an entrance point that lands you right up onto the actual um, uh, deck or garden terrace of the uh, restaurant. And of course, this here is all the extension, but it still re retains the original structure around the other side. But this is a very definite move insertion, but it brings with, with it, sorry, um, with it all the facilities and um, access requirements that are needed, like bathrooms, et cetera, um, so that people can enjoy this amenity. Um, I also wanted to look at, say, a, a public building, and this was a project that Dublin City Council um, had uh, done with um, OPW. It was really a partnership thing of the local authority going with OPW and uh, dealing with the external public realm as part of the overall upgrade. Um, so this is the before situation where you can sort of see you know, badly up and down pavement, trees lifting the pavement. And this is the after where this whole um, forecourt has been redesigned. And those concepts of keeping it clear of bits and bobs, keeping uh, things well placed within that, and then the entrance being created in this store here. And then within the building, of course, um, a new vertical circulation had to be thought about and um, a location for a lift shaft was identified. Um, and the importance of experiencing this building and its history really was dependent on the insertion of um, good vertical circulation. Um, it also um, had to deal with um, part of the building not being really um, um, reachable by, from the new lift because um, there was sort of a um, circuitous route to the building. And so in the, the main stairwell where you had one side had a, a mezzanine that brought you across the, the stairwell void, it didn't have a match on the other side, so you couldn't do a continuous loop. And part of the, um, the access requirements was to create a new contemporary um, um, access route across the other side and that gave access to full access to this new restaurant facility at the first floor level uh, up here. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that sometimes to keep a building in good use to um, deal with the long-term benefit of having a really good use that's going to stay in a building for a long time it really is worthwhile working at um, the access requirements and all of that and trying to make them work for, for the building in a very well considered um, way. Um, so that's uh, one of my, I think, great, interesting case studies. This is another one that had this sort of long term vision of itself that wanted to stay in a particular site that had a particular cultural significance, had a particular story to tell. This is the Museum of Literature. Um, and it's, it's another com complexity to it because it, it is two protective structures that are interconnected and then a third, so you have three interconnected uh, buildings. And dealing with the access to that and getting all the floors working together um, was, was, was challenging, but also to get uh, you in the front door, which is these set of steps here. And one of the things um, about the front door is um, that the threshold stone had been worn down um, uh, by the students stepping over the threshold. And um, the, the curator did not want to remove that um, story from the building. So um, main access is kept to the front of the building, but um, there is um, a cut in the wall and not, you know, desirable to cut an 18th century uh, boundary wall of, of a building of this prominence, but um, it was done in such a way uh, that it was as minimal as possible. And that gave level access uh, through the basement to the rear of this property here, where this lift shaft was designed so that it serviced all the floors, gave you access to very good bathrooms, um, except exhibition space and then um, at the back and you can just sort of see it here 
the fire ex um, escape from this building was routed across and down the new staircase in that. So that was a, that was a big design move. Um, and I suppose how that was all going to be um, considered in the context of that uh, set of buildings. Um, and as I say, the access designed to it took a while with a multidisciplinary team, but I think it, it's a good long-term solution for that building that will keep it um, viable. And then a lesser one would be, and the, the Georgian one, uh, the Georgian topology very much um, dominated our thinking in Dublin City Council and um, trying to deal with the sort of cultural quarter of Marion Square and how you deal with the Georgian typology and make uh, spaces available for bigger groups of people to visit and accessibility. This was one where, you know, dealing with car parking and rear access for everybody, uh, bikes and, and all the rest. And then a pair of stairs that went down either side of this decorative uh, ornamental uh, terrace that was designed to the back of the property um, seemed to be a reasonable compromise in, in that situation. Um, but there are also, um, other front access Georgian uh, ones. And then I just wanted to deal with, um, I mean, I'm aware like, like these buildings do sometimes return to residential use. Uh, this one was uh, on Main Square and an elderly wealthy lady wanting to have a lift insertion and how that was dealt with was this um, designed insertion here, which gave access uh, to basement and ground floor. And I think it actually went sliding up there as well. So the, all the new stuff in terms of accessibility, uh, bathrooms, lifts, services, um, all went into this uh, new piece between the old and this uh, return here at the back. There's an interesting uh, case study. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then sometimes, uh, you know, uh, really paying attention to how access, um, access can be given at street level and so that it doesn't uh, de detrimentally or incrementally uh, impact on, on a rhythm or a character area. This, I felt, was a, a good solution in that the carriage arch was used to insert um, a platform lift, which actually got got over the levels and got you into the buildings in the lesser room to the rear of, of the property. Um, I'm sorry, the slide is clearer than on the screen, but it, it avoided the alteration here and the, um, how I say, the projection of a platform lift um, out into the street. It allowed a very nice new entrance, as I say, through this building. Um, a lot of uh, funding at the moment is going to uh, cultural uses and adaptation of buildings. And I thought this one was a really interesting one. And I suppose the approach uh, is that, um, you know, the new services, the lifts, the bathrooms can all be planned into a contemporary extension to the rear of the property. Um, the level access is dealt with in the public realm. Um, and, you know, you're able to move through uh, contemporary doors, as I say, this idea of sliding doors, but keeping the original doors within the building. Um, and um, I suppose putting the building back into very good uh, community use, um, really becoming a focal point of the town. Um, I'm nearly there now. I just wanted to show you a, a selection of, a, of different projects uh, as maybe aid memoirs for other scenarios. Um, this is Henrietta Street, and this was uh, a project that was recognised at a European level. Um, and really, um, there was several aspects to this. Um, it was design of the, um, the lift shaft and the bathroom facilities for the museum, how it connects to the actual historic building itself. Um, but this has made this building, you know, accessible uh, to basement ground and first so that um, somebody can enjoy the uh, exhibition in, in, of the building and sits very favorably with the rear of, of the property. Internally, um, the main staircase had been removed when this building was a tenement and a contemporary redesign 
in the character of, of a, a Georgian staircase was reinstated. Um, but I suppose the overall access strategy and plan very much worked with the fabric of the building and didn't remove historic fabric, but actually tried to give as much access and I suppose coherence to what had become quite a fragmented uh, building. And this one is the Goethe Institute, um, which also worked with the Georgian typology where um, the rear of the site had been lost in terms of the buildings removed and working with the section, uh, it was reinstated so that the uh, basement vaults were put back with contemporary construction and a whole new contemporary building put to the rear, which had all the access, uh, the lifts, um, the services, the bathrooms that uh, compensated for the, the principal structure itself. And this is all um, ac accessible through to the ground floor of the principal structure. And that's it. Um, so I just wanted to conclude on just some thoughts that I had. As I said, this lecture very much um, um, made me reflect back on 20 years of practice. And I suppose um, I am grateful to Maraid for reaching out to Built Heritage. And I suppose it would be useful to have a collection of best practice exemplars in the future to guide such uh, work. Um, I think integrated and permanent solutions um, that are designed as a, um, how I say, holistic approach and as, as one landscape seem to me to be working the best. So it's from the outside in, and taking the opportunity to adjust where you can seems to work um, very well with built heritage. Minimal intervention and appropriate materials are really hugely important. Going back and looking at uh, projects, as I say, that have weathered over time, I think using appropriate materials and, and really well considered detailing is critical to them looking right and not detracting from the setting. Um, maintenance, I've mentioned, I mean, I, I found it very interesting where we went to a lot of trouble to put in platform lifts outside, say, Georgian buildings. You know, uh, the reality of them is that they're used very minimally and they have a huge maintenance issue in terms of, um, you know, they get forgotten about and then they don't work. So where you can actually uh, do your access um, intervention within the building, I think it's much happier. Um, where you're depending on mechanical and maintenance, I think that's a it's a it's a big ask. And I, I would have been very familiar with the mansion house and the external lifts to the mansion house would have been a huge problem. Any anytime we had a public event, it was a real issue to get people in and out of the building. Um, and it and that's under consideration again. Um, I suppose there's a lot of things have changed in the meantime. As I say, climate action and sustainability and all these things now I think are going to become much more part of the access planning, but also uh, the digital abilities that we have and how we can actually um, share and, and give experience of places uh, to people who maybe can't get to every level or aspect of, of building. Um, so yes, a lot done and more to do. And I think um, working in a collaborative way um, and also I suppose the opportunities, as I say, that come from are um, working with the new European Bauhaus and working with the European architectural policies and the national policy itself um, will be beneficial to this overall topic. So thank you.